Hi there, you're listening to the Guitar Speak podcast, produced here in Sydney, Australia, where we speak to leading guitarists, luthiers, gear builders, festival programmers, film documentary makers, pretty much anyone making great contributions to the world of guitar. And thanks for joining me. My name is Matt Wakeling. Now today we continue our talk with some of the fantastic artists who will be at the Sydney Guitar Festival, which is right on our doorstep coming up starting on August 23rd, running until August the 27th. Now today we speak to acoustic wizard Van Larkins, Australian blues icon Fiona Boys, and the globe-trotting and genre-busting Adam Miller. Now I want to give a shout out to the Acoustic Uprising film premiere that is at the Sydney Guitar Festival. If you've been listening, you know we've been talking about this for a while. Not least of all because we are involved at Guitar Speak Podcast. So coming up on Saturday the 25th of August at the Chatswood Concourse for only 12 bucks, you get to see the Sydney premiere of the incredible Acoustic Uprising film, a wonderful documentary about progressive and contemporary acoustic guitar playing featuring some of the absolute legends of the style. Andy McKee, uh, Tommy Emmanuel, Kaki King, Newton Faulkner, and not least of all, the guy you're listening to right now, Van Larkins. Now the event features the film, of course, uh, also a Q&A with myself and director Drew Rollins and a live performance from Van. So get to sydneyguitarfestival.com.au to get your tickets for that event. It'll be great. We'd love to meet you. Come and say hello. Now Van got caught up in the, all the, the Candy Rat record label artists, which really pioneered and, and got the word out about some of these incredible polyphonic and percussive acoustic guitar players that started to emerge. Van became an incredible proponent of the style uh, eventually signing to Candy Rat Records himself, which is pretty awesome. Building signature guitars, touring the world, especially uh, Canada. He has he has a great following over there. It was great to meet Van. Let's listen to a little bit more of him. This is a track called Cold Fusion. It's from his latest album, Cinder Man. Then we'll get to the interview. Van Larkins, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Oh, thanks very much, Matt. Great to have you. Now, you are super busy. It looks like there's lots of really great stuff going on in your career. But if we wind it back a bit, what led you to guitar in the first place? Uh, well, I mean, if I go back as far as I can kind of remember with the guitar or with music in general, the only thing I sort of, I, I would learn music really quickly, you know, by ear. Um, so I started off, I had a, a like a toy keyboard when I was a kid and I'd play along with Disney movies and figure out all the songs um, wow. all the melodies on that little toy keyboard and, and I'd find anything around the house like um, I remember picking up a, an egg slicer and if you squeeze the outside egg slicer it changes the pitch of the little wires when you uh-huh. pluck them so you could actually awesome. create you know music on, a, on an egg slicer anything really I could get my hands on um, and then That's cool. uh, my, my dad put a guitar in my hands when I was 13 and, and taught me a few chords and I'd play along with records so um, that's 
it seems to be a bit of a pattern amongst um, guitarists that play the sort of style that I do, the style of guitar. Um, it's like a, it's really common for guitarists to start around sort of 12, 13 mm-hmm. um, and start off listening to a lot of kind of heavy metal and and, um, and then progress from there. I'm not sure what, <laughs> what, what that is, but uh, it seems to be a bit of a pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and that led me to um, finger style guitar. I left school when I was um, uh, just after year 11 and went straight into TAFE and my teacher gave me this old piece of guitar music which was originally written for harp and it had been re-transcribed for a guitar and that's, that was the start of my finger style guitar playing. Yeah, I was, I was interested in the progression from, I guess, more conventional guitar playing like all of us kind of start out on. Um, um, sure. And yeah, the, the, the metal guitar into... Something uh, more nuanced is is not a um, is not an unusual way to do it. Yeah, it's not uncommon at all. <laughs> I, I, can't, I mean, you you're, you teach guitar as well as as performing all around the world. Um, I, I kind of get the idea that with things like metal. I mean, all the guitar parts are so obvious and upfront. Maybe that's why yeah. that you know that kind of heavy guitar draws a lot of you're young right. people you know, in. Things like Metallica. You know, Metallica is very much about the guitar. Mm-hmm. So um, we don't have a lot of that anymore, I think. But um, so we can all kind of relate. I mean, I have students coming in to, to learn that are, you know, six or seven or eight years old and they want to learn Metallica. So it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a timeless thing. But yeah, I think you're right there. I think because it's so guitar orientated, we sort of gravitate, gravitate towards that. But um, yeah, I just, uh, and I was a bass player in a metal band as well okay. when, when I was in school. Um, I think there were already two guitarists in the band, so position was filled but I'm I'm really um, I'm kind of thankful for that because I learned to play more of a supporting role um, early on and also I connect I, I still play like a bass player sometimes you know I tune my I tune my acoustic guitar a bit lower than usual you know usually down to a C or often down to an A if I'm okay. playing certain songs yeah wow um, <clears throat> so that experience playing a supporting role um, and playing a uh, you know like a bass guitar kind of led me towards lower tunings and um, of course I was in a uh, a collaboration in, in a guitar duet for um, about eight years before I went solo and that was called Hunter Van Larkins and that mm-hmm. got me um, that kind of landed me a, an album on on Candy Rat Records in the state. Yeah, awesome. So, and Candy Rat, of course, is um, so well known for really progressive acoustic guitar. So that's pretty awesome that you you landed with those guys. Very, yeah, pretty lucky. Yeah, I remember that was uh, um, a moment. Um, again, this is something I've heard other people say as well. You know, they um, we just, when we started watching uh, YouTube, we discovered uh, this video called "Drifting" by a guy called Andy McKee. Andy McKee, yes. And um, and that was an introduction into kind of open tuning and, and percussive playing. And I, before that, I didn't realize that you could play drums on the guitar at the same time as playing the guitar. Uh huh. So that was that was a real moment for me where I kind of that that kind of put me on a path. Before that, I was playing you know folk, Celtic folk music essentially, okay, yeah. um, acoustic, and that sort of that's when I realised wow, if I tune lower, it's like a bass guitar. If I play drums on it, and then you know two hand tapping is like a keyboard. So essentially, you become the band on an acoustic guitar. Listening to a track like Cold Fusion from your from your latest album, Cinder Moon. Um, yeah, it's amazing. There's so much polyphony going on, um, and the parts, and you're doing it all in live in one in one pass. It's incredible. Those overdubs, the open yeah. string overdubs. Oh, sorry, not the overdubs, the open string harmonics. Um, yep. In that front passage, they sound like overdubs. But when I watch you do it, you're obviously just zipping up to those and keeping yeah. <laughs> the wrist going. It's That's something. Awesome. It seems to be a habit I've kind of fallen into playing like a um, a repetitive. Uh, bass line on the guitar and kind of the A string, D string, somewhere around there. Uh-huh. And then having these kind of nice high harmonics ringing out throughout so you can be careful really not to mute, careful not to mute certain strings. Yeah. Um, and it's just something I just really enjoy playing. It's, it sounds really, it sounds great to my ears, but it's also a lot of fun to play. It was a bit of a challenge to kind of master that technique of mm-hmm. having a repetitive line and only having a split second to jump up to the 12th fret and, and throw a harmonic in. So... Yeah, man. Yeah, it's, it's heaps of fun. And I love the register as well, you know, like playing really, really low notes and then having these nice, sweet, high harmonics kind of floating over the top. When you say with the lower tunings, say for a tune like Cold Fusion, what, what's your exact tuning? So is that down to the C or the A? 
Yeah, that's actually um, all for the recording and the, and the film clip. That was down to um, down to a B. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it was like an open B, um, open B minor. Okay. But I've since changed that um, because I've in the past I would uh, quite often snap the G. Um, just because it's kind of has the thinnest core out of all of the strings, and and repetitive tuning would weaken the string at the machine head, and it would just snap all the time, and it was yeah. driving me crazy. <laughs> so I, well, I just realised one day I thought, well, if I just tune one semitone higher, open C minor, um, I don't have to tune the E string down or the G string down. Okay, yeah. So it saved me a lot in strings. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's actually the, my new favorite tuning is what I'm using now currently for Cold Fusion, which is C, G, C, G, C, E. Okay. Uh, sorry, E flat. E flat for the and minor, yeah. In the top. Yeah, so there's your minor third on top. And what I love about that is if you tune the first string up, um, up to an E, yep. uh, it becomes an open major chord. Yeah, awesome. And that's so really so easy, versatile. just the top of the range. Yeah, yeah. that's great. You know, and um, it's, I think it's probably my favorite open tuning. Um, just because after Dad Gad, Dad Gad's probably my second favourite, just because it's it's a little bit bland in comparison, I think, because at least there's a third in in this tuning, the open C yeah, sure. that I use. Um, but it just opens up a lot of possibilities melodically um, with harmonics. Yeah. Um, and it also simplifies all the chord shapes and patterns um, in a lower register. So that's where I sort of lean towards playing playing songs like. Um, like Cold Fusion and um, a Backstorm and that sort of thing from my new album. So what, what guitar are you um, putting through all these crazy tunings? Uh, at the moment, I've, um, I've had a, uh, had a guitar. I've been playing a French guitar for the last bit of five years. I picked up in Montreal um, a Chatelier guitar, and it was actually given to me by a builder. I played my new song I'd just written while I was staying at the Candy Rat headquarters in Milwaukee. Uh-huh. And then I went up to the Montreal Guitar Show and picked this, this French one up. Um, and I've just recently had a uh, my first signature guitar built. Um, you know, world's first Van Larken signature, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, wow. And I've, I've had this guitar built um, by Luke Calquist in Brisbane, Calquist Guitars. Um, and this guitar is built around the tuning that I use. Okay. As yeah. well as the sort of percussive playing and... Um, when you knock on the soundboard, the front of the guitar, um, it, it's actually a C. Like if you can tune, if you can hear the oh, note okay. that that is making when you're okay. tapping on the guitar, it's actually a C. So when it's, that's what actually inspired me to change to this open C rather than lower. Okay. Um, yep. And so I can, <laughs> it's so crazy. I can actually achieve harmonics on every single fret except for the eleventh and thirteenth fret on the guitar, which I have never. I've never experienced. You're not supposed to be able to do that, as far as I know. Wow! But um, That's every crazy. single fret has clear harmonics. No <laughs> way. Um, and and the overtones are. Um, it's it's like playing. Um, it's like playing a reverb built into your guitar, essentially. So, wow! That is um, nuts. So that, yeah, yeah. It's so it's so much fun, and to have a guitar built around kind of the playing style and tuning that you're using, it's um, it's just amazing. And it's it's technically a baritone guitar, but it's tuned a little higher. Okay, yep. I was just going to ask yeah. about range. So is that got an extended range? Oh, sorry, in terms of um, scale length, I should say. Oh, it is, yeah. It's a 27 and a half inch okay. scale length. So it is a, it's a baritone guitar, um, but rather than standard tuning down to B. Yeah, like a um, B to B. It's uh, open C. So it's, there's a lot more tension. Um, like the G is still a G. And the E, a lot of the time, is still the E, the, the high E. Um, so... There's a lot of tension, which I think kind of it's, it requires a bit more sort of technique in the building of the guitar, but it also gets a lot more volume and a lot more tone. Um, so I'm just loving it. Yeah. So that was the one. That was the guitar that was featured in the Cold Fusion video. Oh, excellent, man. That's great. Yeah. Very, very cool. Now you do lots of touring and gigs. Um... Uh, so I haven't been overseas for a while. That was um, that's my next my next move. But mm -hmm. um, I was playing in duet. And then I went over to Canada and the States, and I've toured since then. I've toured there twice. So um, my music is really well received in Canada. They've got a great sort of um, original acoustic scene. And um, awesome. in Australia, I find it quite a challenge in comparison, um, just because I think most people, you know, like in the sort of general public, want to hear singing or something they can sing along to. It's almost um, in some situations, it's 
kind of like live karaoke in some places. Uh-huh, That's sure. kind of, you know, if it sells, if it sells beer, then yes. it sells the, the, the music is suitable. Whereas what I play, I think mostly people that drink, you know, maybe champagne or, or wine, you know, okay. expensive <laughs> wine that would listen to you kind of, you know, very musical, original acoustic compositions in Australia. So right. it's, uh, but it's been really well received in Canada and the States. Um, they love me over there because I go over there and they're like, oh, do you ride a kangaroo, man? And, you know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's pretty cool. But, uh, so it's, and I've toured the East Coast of Australia twice. I've actually got a third tour coming up, um, okay. which I'm just about to, just about to announce. Um, I'm bringing over Andrew White from uh, New Zealand, and he's um, he was one of my biggest influences earlier on when I was 16, 17. I got a hold of one of his albums, and then later on he came over and produced an album got me and, um, and Ross Hunter in Hunter Van Larkins onto Candy Rat Records. And, um, so it's kind of a full circle thing, having him come over and tour with me. Uh, about September the 18th onwards, um, we're touring for about three months. We're starting on the, the Sunshine Coast, um, hiring out a little hall in, in Udalo, where I used to live for on and off for 10 years. And um, we've got some really great gigs in Brisbane and, and Sydney. Scored some really, yeah, really great gigs. I'm, I'm happy this is uh, this all come together because it's the first time I've actually booked a tour myself. Okay. I've, um, often in the past relied on agents and agencies to to do that work for me, but I've just found that it's um, I don't have the the sort of contact with the venues. I don't really know what's going on um, in that situation. Um, so I've just, even though it's been a lot of work, um, I'm in direct contact with venues, and if they need something, they get it straight away promotional material and it's all just come together really really well oh that's great that's so really cool. um but that's kind of the that's the story you know if you're a um independent kind of original musician in australia you sort of um like myself you need to become a um a tour manager a booking agent a graphic designer yeah um you know um there's so many hats to wear it's uh it can be a little i think sort of stressful sometimes as you can forget to play the guitar sure, <laughs> sure. believe it or not you know yeah. you do so many so many other things and and um you know it's become so absorbed in the business side of things to create a solid platform for your music that you kind of you aren't in that frame of mind to play music yeah so it's a delicate balance sometimes sure all the all the behind the scenes stuff no one no one gets to see yeah um, exactly uh, the, the, maybe the polar opposite of that is that you're also a film star now. I uh, I loved seeing you in the Acoustic Uprising uh, documentary. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, that's uh, I'm really I'm really happy to be a part of that. And that was um, that was a great little sort of chance meeting. Actually, it was. Um, or Drew reached out and sort of you know um, said hello. And I'm getting me a tour with Trace Bundy and and all sorts of really cool things. But I. I met him in Brisbane, um, and Drew came up to Brisbane to, to film my part of the, the movie, my interview. Oh, excellent. And, um, and uh, yeah, and he's, a, he's just a great guy. He's got his, his heart in the music, and um, he's done a great job of the movie. It's just amazing. And it's yeah, the world's it's first finger-style movie. Yeah, incredible. We, um, had, um, we had Drew on the show a couple of weeks ago, and it was really cool to, to hear how he put that all together for sure. Cool. Yeah, so I'm really, really happy to be a part of that. So, and that was funny because I met him at the music shop where I discovered um, Calquist guitars, and then I, that's what led me to getting a signature guitar. So okay, it's kind of, cool. All of these things are connected all the time. I just stopped being surprised by it now. It's yeah. Like, yeah, of course. You know. <laughs> yep. That's awesome, man. Now with the um, with with that film, it's being uh, it's got its Melbourne premiere. Uh, at the Melbourne Guitar Show coming up very, very soon, and then that's right. So you're you're playing at that as well as. Being on I am, the, uh, yeah, I'm going to fly down there and um, I'm going to join up with um, with Drew Rollo as he's presenting the, the movie on the 5th and 6th. So that's I think great. It's this Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. Um, and the Sydney Guitar Festival is yeah. the 26th of, uh, of August. And um, I'll have my new album available for both of these shows as well. Oh, yeah, great. About a month now. Great. Well, I'll be at the the Sydney um, the Sydney premiere. I think there's a, a Q and A happening with Drew and, and myself, and maybe some others. And um, and of course, you're going to be playing a set, which is going to be great because we'll see the film, um, we'll see your spot in there, and then we'll get to um, hear your set, which will be really cool. Really looking forward to that. Awesome. Well, 
awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it as well. I'm excited that there are these guitar festivals popping up in Australia. You know, yeah, like, yeah. I know they've got one in Canada. I've played there a couple of times, but now we've got, um, you know, there's a Brisbane guitar festival and Melbourne and now Sydney. So um, I'm going to kind of try and jump on that and, and just help support that as much as possible because there, there are a lot of, you know, really talented artists in Australia and um, we kind of all have to stick together to uh, to, to kind of, keep it exciting and keep it working here in Australia. So um, I'm really looking forward to being part of the, the Sydney Guitar Festival and the movie as well. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Well, cool. Well, Van, thank you so much. Um, really great to meet you and hear a bit more about your story after hearing a stack of your playing and really digging it. It's um, yeah, great to meet you and looking forward to seeing you live in, uh, in a few weeks. Awesome, man. I'll catch you in Sydney. Thanks very much, Matt. Okay, cheers. Thanks, Van. All right, there you go, my conversation with Van Larkins. And yeah, can't wait for that event. All right, my next guest, Fiona Boyce, is an absolute icon in the Australian blues scene. For over two decades, she's been recording albums, touring incessantly around Australia, Europe, having great success in the United States. And she's a real student of, of the blues in its various regions and nuances. Fiona's an amazing vocalist and an amazing guitar player, both on acoustic and on electric. You're hearing her here on one of her cigar box guitars with that incredible slide tone. This is a tune called Mama's a Sanctified Amp from the album Box and Dice. Fiona Boys, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, our, our pleasure. We're uh, we're excited you're coming down to Sydney for the for the Sydney Guitar Festival. But I'd like to maybe go back a bit earlier. For your career has um, has spanned over twenty five years, fifteen albums. You've toured all over the place. I'm interested, what led you to the blues in the first place? You know, I was the kind of kid that was really not that kind of moved by a lot of the music I was getting as a kid. You know, while while my girlfriends were busy falling in love with pop stars and putting posters on the wall of their bedrooms, um, I was kind of going, nah, it's not doing it for me. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I got to college and there was a really – active folk and blues club on campus um that was in at swinburne um in melbourne Melbourne, yeah okay and um and so the funny thing was that the guy who was running the club at the time was uh really into early blues so the first stuff i ever heard was really raw gritty you know pre-war blues documentary recordings very early okay chicago stuff so So I think a lot of people who, you know, maybe fell in love with the with the Rolling Stones or Eric Clapton or Cream and then worked backwards to find um, the influences, I kind of started really at the at the rootsier end, you know. And I think that's reflected in the way I in the way I play and um, and really enjoy the roots of the music. Okay, yeah, I definitely hear that earlier earlier blues in, in your playing but then I hear a lot of other things as well like it you seem well versed in in lots of the eras and and the playing techniques yeah well I started off um uh as an acoustic um country blues finger picker mm-hmm. um and 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 I think that kind of informs the way I approach things too because I guess some of the first stuff I was hearing um was sort of, sort of the big bill brunsies and Mississippi John Hurt, Reverend Gary Davis, um, all those kind of players. And um, uh, so when – so I was a fan first, for, I should say, to start with. I, for many, many years I discovered blues, fell in love with it, just had it. It was like an, a visceral aha moment of going, I love this stuff. Yeah, wow. And, um, you know, there was quite a few acts coming through Melbourne at the time so and quite a lot of – um, you could go and see blues bands most nights of the week. So mm-hmm. I just became a huge fan and I was immerse, immersing myself in the music. 
But it probably was about another, you know, the best part of eight years before I actually started to play myself. Okay. So I didn't start playing till you know, my mid to late 20s. And um, and I started off with a stack of old vinyls and a borrowed acoustic guitar. And, uh, you know, the first gig I did was, you know, a coffee shop, open night, open mic sort of thing. So Yeah, cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, that's interesting. So a lot of, I mean, a lot of guitar players might start may, maybe a bit younger and maybe there's no influences, you know, they're learning Happy Birthday or Jingle Bells. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about myself right now, but um, I'm pro- probably not exclusive in that. Uh, but yeah, you had, you had a whole deep experience with the music and then, then the playing came in. That's really interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think um, also, you know, then, so then I was playing acoustic and that was very much kind of influenced by that sort of pre-war country blues stuff uh-huh. yep. uh, and I loved early Chicago I loved, I mean I, I, lo- I loved a lot of the electric stuff but you know I was uh, I sort of thought that that was a bit too you know gritty I hadn't really thought about playing electric yeah okay. and then I had the opp- and then I had the opportunity to join a band so I thought gee I'll look like an idiot playing acoustic with a band I better borrow an electric <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, and that and that band was playing more I guess swing and New Orleansy blues. So okay. then, you know, I plunged myself into um, you know more T Bone Walker sort of stuff. Yeah, cool. Um, it's you know I certainly didn't think that I would I would tackle some of the grittier Chicago stuff um, that I'm doing these days. But you know I had the chance to um, to go to America and meet some of the you know original players, and um, so being able to uh, meet and hang out with with people like uh, Hubert Sumlin, who yes. who was uh, of course Hounding Wolf's guitarist, um, and a huge influence when I found out he was a finger picker too. You see, okay, because um, I've never played, you know, I never took to a to a plectrum even when I swapped on to electric. Okay, yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, I read I read um about you meeting Herbert Sumlin. That's that's amazing. Tell me how that came about and and what happened there. Um, well, I got, um, you know, I think because I'm essentially self-taught and I'd been playing acoustic, um, doing the country blues stuff, and then I had the opportunity to play electric in a band, which was difficult because my my, um, my template for playing was, you know, the acoustic blues, you're trying to do little bits of bass line, mm-hmm. little bits of melody, little bits of fill. Yep. So it doesn't relate to your job as an electric guitarist in a band Sure, at all. Sure. I had no idea how to play straight rhythm or straight single note lead, so that was a long time coming. Okay, yep. Um, but I, but I, and I was, and I guess because I was learning in isolation, it, it took me a while. I certainly didn't want to put myself into any sort of competitive situation, so it took me a long time, but I finally went in the playoffs um, for the Melbourne Blues Appreciation Society's um, involvement in the International Blues Challenge in Memphis. They have a competition every year and then they sponsor a, a blues musician to go to Memphis and compete in this um, event, Brilliant. which is run by the American, um, well, the Blues Foundation, which is the peak body for blues in the world uh-huh. in Memphis. And um, I ended up going to Memphis. It was my first trip to America. Wow, and so cool. I, and, and I had no idea because I, I never, I'd always wanted to go uh, to the home of the blues, but of course, by that stage, I was a musician, so I was broke. <laughs> so uh, they bought me a ticket, and I, off I went, and I was representing them in the solo duo section. So I was playing my solo country blues finger picking stuff. Mm-hmm. But. Um, but I won that competition, and it was the first time a non-American and a, and a woman had won, oh, and wow. that kicked open these doors for me. And I had the opportunity to go back then, and and um, I actually met Hubert. Uh, Hubert came out and toured with me here in Australia with my band. Um, I originally met Bob Margolin, who was Muddy Waters guitarist okay. for many years, wow. and he's. Um, proven to be quite a mentor and influence 
and, you know, dragged me into that sort of grittier electric stuff and made me feel empowered enough to uh, tackle some of that stuff. Wow. And he was awesome. going to... He was going to come out to Australia and, and tour with me, um, and he, and his booking agent had double booked him, and so that particular year he he contacted me and said, "Look, I can't come, but how about if we send Hubert Sumlin instead?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, "Oh my god, <laughs> um, there that would be fine." I'm scared a little bit, but <laughs> because. You know, Hubert, I rem- remember when I was telling you that pivotal moment of falling in love with the blues, some of this sort of stuff was hearing things like Moaning at Midnight and Smokestack Lightning, mm-hmm. those seminal Howling Wolf tracks yeah, wow. were hugely um, foundational to my love of the music. So, you know, to, to have a chance to meet those guys and play with them and, and hang out with them, you know, I, I spent a weekend... Um, once with Hubert in his home, just hanging and talking and hearing his stories and jamming and, you know, it's just an incredible link to the living traditions of the music. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, when you say the living traditions, he was uh, he, right there, right there in the, in the meat of it. That's, that's incredible. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, for the not for the guitar players, but, you know, I was sitting with Hubert in his house and uh, the phone rang and it was James Cotton, you know, it's like hugely important um, blues harmonica player. And I'm just going, I can't believe, you know, I (laughs) pinch myself. I felt a little bit like, you know, Cinderella gets to go to the ball. Um, So, yeah, it's been um, really interesting. And and I think that those um, opportunities to to play with some of the elder statesmen of the blues has Certainly, I can hear those influences in in my playing and 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 some of the more recent stuff that I've been doing with the um, the cigar boxes and and the more Mississippi style um, electric guitar. I can mm-hmm. hear in you know recent chances to visit those places and and he, and hear the musicians there playing. That's that's amazing. That's that's so cool. I'm I'm really fascinated when you talk about the different geographical regions and I mean these days in this kind of globalized world, you know, music scenes popping up in in different um geographies is is less of less of a thing but but you talk about the Chicago sound and then the country blues which was a south more in the south and then the New Orleans more towards the uh the east coast but these places i mean geographically aren't that far apart and yet and yet all these places had very different sounds because obviously um pre you know with the with the technology they they were a long way apart i guess in terms of communication and and influencing one another and then yeah you had the mississippi influence as well That's yeah i mean there, there is i mean there's a lot of different variations even in the acoustic blues world between you know, the sounds in, in Atlanta and in, in Memphis and in the Carolinas. And, and of course, you know, you meet players. You know, I had a chance to spend some time with Cephas and Wiggins and, and um, John Cephas was, uh, you know, really considered one of the epitome of the Piedmont-style mm-hmm. finger pickers. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of variations and and you, and you meet people who are who are very firmly embedded in their regional styles. Uh-huh. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm a master of none, but a bit of a bowel <laughs> bird. Um, yes, yeah. In, in, in as much as I, I can hear where I've picked up different um, influences from, from exploring those different styles. And, and to me, that's something that I'm really passionate about because I think, you know, people often think of blues as a fairly narrow genre. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, I'm, I'm continually surprised and excited as a player and a songwriter um, ha- how much more there is to, to explore and discover. Um, and, and I think um, that's really interesting because as, as a player, it seems to me um, that you have this wonderful dynamic tension between having some very fixed signposts. I mean, mm-hmm. you can hear a blues lick and go, okay, that's blues. 
Um, but then each generation and each musician has to try and um, – it's still a dynamic art form, you know, so the, the challenge is then to take something that is traditional and find your own unique individual voice within that tradition. So so that's that's the um, – that's the delightful challenge, and and um, and I, I find it really interesting and inspiring. Yeah, fantastic. You mentioned the cigar box guitars; they are so cool. Um, are they a four string? I was trying to count the strings. <laughs> count the strings. Well, of course, it's more traditional for a cigar box to be generally three strings. Okay, is, yep. is kind of the thing. But and um, and I've seen them over the years, and I didn't even. It's funny because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm coming to Sydney to play in the one of the events is a dedicated Slide concert and yeah. uh, and in, to be honest, Slide is a relatively new thing for me. Okay. Um, but uh, I, 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 you know, until relatively recently, I didn't play Slide at all, and I used to see these cigar boxes, um, and I think I'm a guitarist. What on earth am I going to do with this? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's doesn't have enough strings what what's going on here um but i was um i was on tour with a an iconoclastic um american musician called watermelon slim who uh, is a harmonica player and a dobro player mm-hmm. and uh we were passing through yak and Danda and there was a chain soul six string cigar box hanging on the wall the Star Hotel. We had a gig in the pub, and I just went, "Oh my goodness, there's a cigar box guitar that's actually got six strings and um, looks like it's a bit more like a normal guitar." So I got it off the wall and uh, fell in love with it, <laughs> and then that was the beginning. That was the thin edge of the wedge. Oh, that's cool. um, so yeah, my original um, cigar box is a six stringer, um, and of course. Every cigar box is, um, tends to be an outsider instrument, so they're, they're handmade essentially and often out of bits and bobs and junk, so it's, um, it's a bit of a beast to keep in tune and the intonation is pretty shocking. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it has, um, it has this sort of mongrel junkyard appeal and it's a, it's a good, good sounding instrument. So then I moved from there to um, a four string which was uh, much more traditional. Um, it has very high action so, and a square neck. So then you, uh, that led to the commitment of having to play it lap style. Yeah, okay. Um, and I actually, with, uh, with a technique that I picked up from Watermelon Slim, I play that on my knee using a little miniature whiskey bottle as a slide. Oh, cool. Um, and, and that... Those sort of guitars are pretty much usually just tuned like one five one five. Um, okay. And mine is B flat, B flat F, B flat F. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Great. If if I'm when I'm listening to your new record, Professing the Blues, um, on tracks like Mama's Sanctified Amp and I Done Quit, what am I hearing there? The, the tone's um, killer on that. Well, that is is actually the the um, the little junkyard six string. That's the six. Um, okay, that's, awesome. Um, Mama sanctified amp. That's um, the that is the uh, six string. Yeah. Um, Tiny pinch of sin, Louisiana. Those kind of um, songs are on the four string. Okay, cool. Um, and I mean, one of the delightful things about the four string is you've only got two notes essentially, but there's uh, yeah. In many ways, the limitations of it is the is the joy, and um, and they really have quite an amazing tone. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they will they will definitely be be featuring. Um, I'll be definitely bringing those to the guitar Great. festival for sure. Fantastic. What um what are you plugging them into? Oh, I have a couple of um, beautiful boutique amps, um, and I have I'm just I'm so sad. I've just come back. From um, two months overseas, I was playing in um, mostly in America, but I had a bunch of gigs in Finland and a festival in Germany as wow, well. Awesome. Um, and in the States, I've just got this brand new 
beautiful amp made by Category 5, which is a boutique um, amp maker um, in Dallas, Texas. And it's just gorgeous. But um, unfortunately, that's that's waiting for me in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Okay. <laughs> um, but I have another gorgeous um, boutique amp, which is a tube tone, um, which is which is a, a, what I'll be playing through uh, most likely in Sydney. Yeah. And um, and that's I guess like a a beautiful hand wired boutique remake of a Princeton. Okay. Cool. Um, awesome. So, you know, I don't. I tend to not use any effects. Um, so what I really like is is a is a beautiful uh, valve amp with a bit of lush reverb and just a great a great vintage um, valve tone. That's my yeah, idea. Yeah, cool. It's oh, it's such a it's such an earthy alive tone on on those tracks. It's great. How about yeah. acoustics? That was um, the tube tone was the amp that I recorded with on okay. the Box of album. Ah, oh, nice. Um, the the newest album, which is Professing the Blues, is is actually um, an audio file acoustic album. So that was actually done at Skywalker Ranch in California. Oh wow, that's cool. <laughs> and that's all like done acoustically. So okay. it was weird. There's like no monitors no headphones you just sit in the space where they normally put a symphony orchestra for a soundtrack uh-huh. recording um just with the you know so that's most of that's resonator and you know acoustic instruments and okay. uh, wow awesome so good that's that's amazing now um you've mentioned the the Sydney Guitar Festival so yeah we're totally looking forward to you're coming down uh, seeing you play at that. Now, the event you're playing at is called Slide Evolution with, with Jeff Lang and Dom Turner. That should be a great yeah. night. Yeah, it should be great. And, of course, that's where the cigar boxes will come into their own because yeah, that's cool. you know, where, my, where my, um, my sliding happens these days. Huh? But, um, but having said that, even though the focus is, is on um, the slide, I probably will play... Um, a little bit of Mississippi Hills uh, straight acoustic, uh, so sorry, straight electric guitar, mm-hmm. and I'm, and with it being a guitar festival, I probably will have to play a couple of tunes on um, my beautiful Res Electric baritone. Oh, awesome! Because um, I've got it's very rare. It's one of only two in existence. Oh, okay. I I, um, oh, right. I got hold of um, the. National Factory in California, and uh, they don't actually make them. That this was a custom made, uh, custom build that I managed to get my hands on, and um, yeah, so it's it's a baritone, but it's res electric, so it's has this fabulous tone. Oh wow! It's, um, yeah, that's also on my box and dice album that instrument, but okay. um, yeah, gorgeous. So of course it's tuned halfway between a guitar and a bass, so you got those beautiful low tones yeah so, nice like, so astonishing do you tune that from b to b like conventional baritone tuning yes i do and i recorded it like that mm-hmm. and then when i and i fell in love with the whole baritone thing but you see because it's got these beautiful tones it's um it'd be sort of criminal to capo it or anything yeah and then of course because it's tuned down lower um Everything that you know how to sing is now too low, so you have to sort of build a repertoire. For okay, this yeah, instrument. Cool. And I wanted to take it. I wanted to have some baritone on "Professing the Blues" on the acoustic album. Mm-hmm. Um, and because the baritone that I have is an electric instrument, what I ended up doing was taking my my beautiful National Style O acoustic resonator and doing some songs in standard tuning, and then some I detuned into a baritone voicing. Okay. <laughs> so they're in C sharp. Okay, uh, wow. That was about as low as I could get my okay, yeah, right. resonator down before it started flapping on the yeah, neck. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now, I, you know, sometimes I've been tuning the baritone to C because, you know, I've got some songs in C sharp now and some in B, which is okay. just for the practicalities of gigging. Yes, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Oh, that's great. 
So that's, that's a whole truck full of instruments you'll be you'll be bringing down by the sounds of things. <laughs> well, I, I will. I'd say that I will have at least four. I Great. think I'll have two cigar boxes, the yep. baritone and the electric. Okay. Um, I used to laugh at people that had all these, you know, used to turn up in guitar <laughs> shops with guitars, but yeah. and now I've become one. Yeah. But it is it's so much fun, and I really enjoy um, the different textures of that the different instruments afford me. So um, yeah, I'll I'll definitely be bringing those. Long. Oh, excellent. That's great. Cool. Well, Fiona, thank you so much for your time. Really great to meet you and uh, and talk about this amazing career, which is, it just seems to be going from strength to strength. So it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I've been, been lucky the last few years, you know, in particular, I've been spending um, time in Europe um, a lot and in the States, of course. Um, and you know, this this year I've just come back from the Blues Music Awards in the States where I had um, two nominations in this year's Music Awards for the new album, which is an incredible honour. It's, um, you know, it's the sort of the, the, it's sort of the Grammys of the blues, really. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, it's fantastic to be able to be part of that and to, you know, represent Australian blues on, on the world stage. Yeah, fantastic. And they're not your only nominations with that particular organisation either, I, I note as well. So, fantastic. Yeah, I've, uh, it's actually my sixth and seventh nominations over the years and wow. it's, they've been, um, you know, I think my, my interest in different things has kept everybody guessing, even the Americans, because I've had nominations in... Um, in the acoustic artist, acoustic album, contemporary album, traditional female, uh-huh. Uh-huh. traditional album, you know, so. Um, That's all yeah, those influences but, again, all those different areas yeah, you've, you've yeah. dug into. That's cool. Yeah, it is. It is. It's very cool. And a, and a great honour because um, as far as I know, I'm the only Australian to be nominated in those awards. And it, it is it's, it truly um, a great honour. And that's also been the places where I've, had a chance, you know, because everybody goes to those at the, the Blues Music Awards in Memphis. It's um, one of the peak times of the year to be there, and it, you know, all the the labels and the stars and the people are in town and often at the ceremony, yeah, which cool. is amazing. I mean, I, I you know, I never had a chance to see Coco Taylor, and I saw her perform at one of the Blues Music Awards, and um. You know, so that's often been a place where you have a chance to mingle and 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 meet um, some of. I've had a chance to meet some of my heroes, and uh, and it's a hell of a party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the best. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, yeah, as I said, we're totally uh, looking forward to seeing you come down to Sydney, and um, yeah, look look forward to catching that gig. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Jeez, mate. Thank you. All right, Fiona Boys, such an authentic and real voice for the blues and a great player. Really cool to meet her. All right, my final guest in today's episode is Adam Miller, who's won an incredible amount of critical acclaim as both a solo acoustic guitarist and as an electric ensemble member. He uh, fuses his love of jazz and groove and funk and atmospheric musics into an incredible package. Let's listen to uh, one of his recent tracks. This is a song called Wrong Note Blues from the album Shifting Units. And then we'll get on to our conversation with Adam Miller. Adam Miller, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Oh, our pleasure, our pleasure. Now, as we speak, you're, I'm in Sydney, but you're in Tokyo. What's what's going on over there? Uh, 
finishing off a uh, short tour over here. Great. And, um, yeah, yeah, we've just been, um, I've had a few shows over here, so it's been really cool. And uh, going to uh, Tokyo Guitar Stores, which gets a little bit crazy as well. I've heard. Yeah, man. What, what have you seen over there? Um... Oh, look, there's basically everything here. There's way too many fenders in every store. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of the cool, like, yeah, Japanese brands that don't really make it outside of um, Japan because I think they infringe on copyright too closely. But there's a lot of cool, like, uh, Fender and Gibson copies sort of going around that are really well made. So they're really fun to check out. Awesome, man. That's cool. Now, when you are in Australia, yeah. where, where is home for you? Home for me is Newcastle. Okay, fantastic. Not too far yeah. from us, yeah. Not too far at all. You do seem to spend a lot of time abroad as well, though. How do you divide your time up during the year? Um, at, at the moment, it's a pretty chaotic schedule. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm usually in the US uh, three or four times a year. Yep. Um, I, it's worked out that I'm touring Europe a couple of times a year now. And then uh, I try to make it to Japan or somewhere as well. Um, obviously, there's a lot of playing in Australia as well. And I also am one of the lecturers in guitar at Newcastle University. So there's a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of juggling going on with my <laughs> life right now. But it's uh, definitely fun. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I was, um, I've been so impressed following you to see... Um, even in the States, some of the, some of the media attention, play, um, places like Guitar Player Magazine and Premier Guitar featuring you and uh, giving you a lot of great coverage. Yeah, that sort of stuff's been pretty incredible. Like to uh, get an interview in uh, Guitar Player Magazine was um, kind of ridiculous, actually. So, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a pretty amazing achievement. Yeah, fantastic. But um, not without merit at all. Um, I'd like to go back a bit, though. What what led you to guitar in the first place, Adam? Um, oh, look, uh, embarrassingly, actually, <laughs> I, well, I started playing organ when I was very young. Yeah, yeah. Um, like four or five years old. And then the song that actually led me to playing guitar was Mona by Craig McLaughlin. Ah, <laughs> yes. That's Which awesome. no one understands, obviously, but... In an Australian interview, I can definitely say it. So that was uh, <laughs> hilarious. But he's uh, he's actually a pretty good guitar player, he and even wails, I've gone yeah. back and listened to that, <laughs> yeah, to that album. I'm like, all right, well, it wasn't that bad. No, no, um, there, was, there was some moments. Yeah, so kind of like that, and um, the like 1927 albums as well, actually, with like Gary Frost playing guitar. Gary Frost is so, great. Um, yeah, yeah. So. Um, that sort of stuff, okay. and then, but then, because I was like nine or ten years old at the time, um, I, somehow my mother bought me a Tommy Emanuel cassette, and that, you know, really got me into instrumental music. It was sort of the the biggest thing there to be able to actually. It was cool because I was like trying to sing, and I sounded terrible. So <laughs> when I heard uh, Tommy's albums, I was just like, "Oh, I sound exactly the same." We both play guitar. Awesome. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and is that where you started working on um, sort of more independence in your parts? So, you know, separating bass lines and melodic um, ideas? Not, not, so, not so much, actually. Um, I was really into Tommy Emanuel's Telecaster player. Probably okay, more than yeah. anything. That's sure. what I really, really... I just dug the fact that there wasn't singing and, um, you know, no one had really exposed me to jazz or anything else that didn't have words. That was the only music I'd ever heard oh, okay. where there wasn't a singer going. So, um, yeah, that was really it. It wasn't until much later that I really got into the whole independent side of things. Okay. So what led you to that part of your play? Well, um, I guess, you know, like through teenage years, got into more in-depth into like Red Hot Chili Peppers and Rage Against the Machine and funk and groove and jazz stuff. Okay, yeah, cool. And, um, that, yeah, and then it just worked out that I did get a opportunity to open shows for Tommy Emanuel when he just started playing solo. And um, so I basically really delved into solo guitar playing. Wow. But then also how to um, 
like start to play funk, jazz, and groove stuff on solo guitar. Yep, awesome. Yeah. I've read that bass players had a, a big influence in your playing as well. Can you explain that a bit? Oh, definitely. Well, obviously, the so the music I'm pretty much playing now solo is very bass driven, and um, everything sort of has a groove behind it. So I definitely work into sort of studying a lot of bass players. Um, you know, uh, one of my greatest, you know, favorite artists is um, Amer- uh, American. A Sydney jazz player named uh, Steve Hunter. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, amazing bass player. And yeah, yeah, so I just got into his music really young and used to, you know, always sort of get into sort of watching him more than the guitar player he playing with a lot of the time. Okay, yeah. Um, so that was like from the many notes point of view. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, then getting into, well, you know, probably my biggest influence uh, career and, you know, direction-wise other than Tommy Lennon really would have been Charlie Hunter. Okay, yeah. Who's cool. uh, an American jazz guitarist, essentially, but yes. um, plays an eight-string instrument. Yeah. Well, that's what he seven-string now. But it has three bass strings yeah. and four or five guitar strings, and yeah, you play cool. both at the same time. Yeah. Great man, yeah. He was, um, well, not was, but is, yeah. A huge, a huge influence on that scene. I mean, even his instruments, though. The the bass end is, you know, it's got that extended range with the fan frets, and he's, um, you yeah, know, running it through a bass exactly. end. Exactly. Kind of stuff too, yeah. Yeah. So you actually play for so the three bass strings go through a bass amp, the four guitar strings go through a guitar amp. Yeah, cool. So it's very split. Like your your bass strings are actual bass strings. They're not any, you know. You, so I actually have Charlie's old guitar. Oh, one really? Of his old seven strings, and oh, I play wow. that around quite a bit as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, but basically for me, it was like whenever I played that instrument, I sounded like a bad version of him sometimes. <laughs> so I decided to focus my energy into sort of reproducing that on six-string guitar. Okay, yep. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Hey, it's inter- interesting you talk about funk and, and groove players because... Um, you know, the world's full of amazing polyphonic, you know, acoustic and solo electric players these days, but not a lot of them take it yeah. into a funk and a groove kind of level in, in the same sort of neighbourhood as you. Yeah. Um, I guess it's sort of a difficult thing, and a lot of it for me has been that I wanted to improvise it as well. Uh-huh. But, um, I really wanted to be able to, yeah, improvise bass lines and improvise you know, melodic and lead solo lines. And so a lot of it came around to the development of that. But in doing that, not only do you have to understand all your improvisation correctly, but you also then have to understand your bass lines to support that. And then you have to put the technique together to be able to execute it all at the same time. So it's a very long-term process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was doing it for you know, how long, really, like 12 years before I was willing to commit it to recording on it, okay. an album, doing wow. it solo. Wow. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, and every day I feel like I'm learning something new and, you know, screwing something up at the same time. <laughs> so um, I think I think the thing about this is that it, it's not an easy thing to learn, to, uh, you know, um, a lot of the techniques that you learn to play solo guitar, usually you rehearse over and over again mm-hmm. until you can, you know, get it perfected for performance. But for me, um, a song changes every single night. So every every performance is unique. And um, every, yeah, so it just, it ends up everything gets turned on its end. And um, I, well, I find that really fun, so... That's why I ventured down that path. Listening to your most recent album, Shifting Units, there's some great solo pieces, but there's some really cool um, band pieces as well. What, what do you enjoy about shifting into an ensemble? Um, look, I I definitely love playing with an ensemble, and um, especially uh, in Newcastle, most of my shows tend to be more 
ensemble playing skills. Okay, cool. Um, it, the reason I record shifting units the way I did is because when I write, it's not necessarily for solo guitar and it's not necessarily for an ensemble, okay. but most of the songs on shifting units, for whatever reason, were mainly record, written for an ensemble. Yeah. So just I was doing a lot of shows at the time and so I was composing for the group. But then I'd go overseas and do a solo and want to play the song, so I'd actually have to learn to arrange the song solo, oh. which was actually really fun because it took me to places that I wouldn't think of if I'd just written songs to solo guitar. Yep. Mm. Very cool. It's great, yeah. I enjoy all the space on that album too. Like for a player as yourself who's, you know, dedicated a lot of your life to getting a lot of your technique together and, and playing all the parts, it seems like when you've got the the rhythm section behind you, um, there's just this another world of phrasing to your playing. Yeah, it's, um, you know, definitely around that time and still always Bill Frizzell is a huge influence on yeah, me well, um, for sure. these days. And... Um, it's it sort of does reflect a lot of that, and I guess because a lot of um, that album Shifting Years was recorded live in the studio as well. They're just you know one take start to finish, and usually they were the first take. Um, you can hear a lot of the result of us. I think sometimes even just working out what we're going to play. Sometimes the uh, space is you know professional hesitation not to jump straight in. Yeah, right. Yeah. But that's great. I think that, yeah, that, that adds that sense of, um, yeah, space and, and, and the interplay too. That's that's really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're excited down here in Sydney. We've got you coming down for the Sydney Guitar Festival. There's some um, some good shows you've got coming up there. Yeah, that's really exciting to uh, be a part of it. Um, it was... Uh, a little bit last minute for me getting uh, added to it, but um, I'm, yeah, real excited that I can be there yeah. and actually then check out other things that are happening. Yeah, cool. Yeah, some, so many great players. You've got um, you've got a gig with Joe Robinson sharing the bill with you in Lead Belly. That should be yeah, a great show. Yeah, Have you met Joe? Have you crossed paths? Yeah. Uh, I met Joe when he was very young, maybe like 12, oh, 11 or 12. Oh, wow. And... Um, We'd uh, jam together at like the Tamworth Country Music Festival, and um, yeah, we've done a, a lot of shows together over the years. Actually, oh, but right. um, we haven't. That being said, we wouldn't have done a show for maybe seven or eight years. So, oh, wow. um, and well, both of us have changed our styles a lot in that time. So, yeah, I think it'll complement very well. Yeah, it should be a fantastic night. And um, you're also running a masterclass. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll just be uh, doing a little bit of teaching, I guess, outlining the you know sort of main ideas I work with when I play solo guitar and sort of how to start to implement them in um, like sort of everyone's own playing. A lot of it's sort of you know just starting to add bass lines to chords and that sort of thing. And that's usually where I start with uh, teaching all that. Cool. Very good. Very good. Well, Adam, mate, thank you so much for your time. I know you're, um, you're flat out over there in Japan as we speak. But, um, yeah, as I Just, mentioned, we're really, really looking forward to seeing you come down um, to Sydney and um, be be great to catch you at one of those shows. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to chat. All right, there you go. Adam Miller. That was really cool. Even though the phone line from Japan was not awesome, it was still really great to meet Adam and talk about what's been an incredible career. Really looking forward to that show in Sydney with Joe Robinson, Michael Fix and Adam all on the one bill at Lead Belly, Newtown, 24th of August. Three Guitar Speak podcast guests on the same gig. That's pretty cool. Adam's going to play us out. This is a track called What To Do While You're Waiting. Before we go, though, remember you can subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher Radio or iHeartRadio and have the podcast delivered to your computer or device thingamajig every single week. Hey, shout out and thanks to Kayla at The PR Files. Great 
PR company in Sydney. Thank you for helping organise these interviews around the Sydney Guitar Festival, these last two episodes. Been very cool speaking to all these amazing guitar players converging on Sydney over this, uh, this coming week. All right, my name's Matt Wakeling. You've been listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye now.